folks, what I'm about to share with you is trouble. But it's also documented, so please bear with me as we move along. Listen to what I have to say, and then make up your own mind. Let me begin by making you a promise. We promise we won't lie to you. Now you expect that, but the reason I say that is because there are other speakers here who can't make the same claim because they have a vested interest in keeping you in the dark. You see, there are only really two histories about who to be 73. There's a history you're supposed to believe, the one I call Opia Pavlov for the masses, the story of how a brave Indian sell off the might and power of the U.S. government during 72 days of very public gunfire, and there's the other history of what happened inside the movie, the history you're not supposed to know. You're not supposed to know that people were abducted and interrogated at Wounded Knee. You're not supposed to know that people were beaten and tortured at Wounded Knee. You're not supposed to know that people were raped and murdered at Wounded Knee. All of it behind the barriers, and all of it excommunicated or condoned by the eight leaders. People like Dennis Banks, Russell Beans, Leonard Crodog, Carter Camp, and Stan Holder. So that's one reason why we call American Indian Mafia the history book they do not want you to read. Now, almost 40 years later, the cover-up has corrupted academia, but once again, you simply won't read about any dirty little secrets from Wounded Knee. Here's one of them. Before the invaders could pose as the green villagers, they first had to evict the real villagers, their fellow Indians, and make it appear as though it was their village and that they lived there all their lives. This is part of the con, and not to take issue with the conference flyer, but it really is not correct to say that 200 of Wala Lakota took over their own town. Only about 10%, approximately 20 people, were from the Congress and agreed to invade their neighbor's community and vandalize their property. The rest of them were reservation outsiders, so they really were invaders who broke into people's homes, stole their personal possessions, wore their clothes, ate their food, slept in their beds, drove their cars, and eventually destroyed their village. All under the approving eye of the TV news people, some of them actually participated in the first village assault on the night of February 27, 1973. That's when about 50 cars drove into the village under cover of darkness. They shot out the street lights, smashed open the doors of people's homes, started fires, looted the training plant, <coughs> took hostages, and shot at responding emergency vehicles. By the time it was over, the village lay in ruins. I know this because my father was there. Joseph H. Trembach was the FBI agent in charge, who became the on-scene commander that night, and who made the fateful decision to erect roadblocks around the village in an effort to cordon off the violence. Little did he know at the time what sort of violence he was attempting to contain. As time wore on, <coughs> and numerous ceasefires were broken, and thousands of rounds were fired in both directions, wounded he became more and more dangerous for the people inside the village. And it wasn't just because of the government blackmail, which was an on-again, on-again threat. It was because AIM leader Dennis Banks became increasingly paranoid about spies in his midst. That's why Carter Camp, Stan Holder, and Larry Crowdock, among others, chained people at beds or otherwise confined and interrogated them. Some of the people who didn't pass the test ended up dead. We estimate that half a dozen people were murdered inside the village versus the one casualty who died from a stray government bullet. Here's a picture of one of the secret murder victims from Wounded Knee. His name is Ray Robinson. He was a civil rights activist under Martin Luther King. Chris Westerman allegedly dumped Ray's body in a hole somewhere near what is now the village ruins after he was shot in the leg and carted off to a makeshift infirmary staffed by, by Madonna Gilbert Thunderhawk and Laura Light of Cora Means, allegedly the last people to see Robinson alive before he bled to death. Ray's widow is here today, Cheryl Robinson. So if there's anyone here, you want to stand up, Cheryl? If there's anyone here who knows something about where her husband was buried, please help her. Cheryl just wants to give her husband a proper burial. You know, that is the Indian way to repatriate the remains of the fallen after the battle is over. <coughs> and by the way, real warrior women would cooperate in that effort. Real warrior women would participate in the cover up of murder. But then real warrior women would not have lined up against anime hate watch as members of the AI patrol and help condemn anime to death after she was interrogated, tortured, and raped. Anime was a prominent figure at Wounded Knee. She was married there. She was an emerging leader of the movement. Murdered two years later because she found out about the secret murders at Wounded Knee and because Dennis Banks mistakenly believed 
Anna May was an FBI informant. She was never an FBI informant. I'll leave the rest of that story to Anna May's daughter, Denise. But the point I want to make is this. The murder of Anna May, the secret murders at Moon and Bean, the murders of FBI agents Jack Moore and Ron Williams, and other murders that Paul Maine will talk about, they're all connected. If you don't understand that, then you won't understand the information in American Indian Mafia, and you'll be right for being conned about the real legacy of Moon and Bean and the American Indian Movement, perhaps the most falsified chapter in recent American history. And just so you know, our beef is not with the AIM membership. Most of them are well-intentioned people trying to improve the lives of their fellow Indians, people like Anna May, who embody the true ideals of the movement the AIM leaders proved they could not live up to. <coughs> had they allowed her to live, the real legacy of Unity might have had a chance to make an appearance in the history books. But sadly, most of what you're reading about Unity or CNT is a whitewash of history, a farce, a cover-up. You see, the media and academia are both complicit in the cover-up. That sort of explains why academics, historians, and so-called investigative journalists are not very interested in interviewing my father, the one person who could have told them what really happened those first two weeks. But then they wouldn't have had a romanticized story about brave Indians holding off the modern-day equivalent of the cavalry. In fact, the first time anyone contacted Joe Trimbach wanting to interview him on film about who he was a few years ago. And Stanley Nelson was working on his PBS documentary, We Shall Remain, Part 5, Moon and Bean. I'm working on a book called We Shall Be Fame, how PBS ignored the real victims of Moon and Bean, the people who lived there and the people who died there, because it will expose Nelson's film as just another Moon and Bean makeover. I guess you could say I had a hand in the production of this film. You see, my father regretfully put me in charge of negotiating with Nelson about our participation. I had only one stipulation. My father would agree to sit down and answer any questions Stanley wanted to ask him about Moody or anything else for that matter, and use that footage in his film. In return, Nelson agreed to interview former A member Richard Tuo, who witnessed Ray Robinson getting shot at Moody and who could have steered Nelson towards the truth. But Nelson, like those before him, had an agenda, and it became obvious he was going to stick to it. You see, Nelson wanted to interview only the perpetrators of Moody, not the victims even after we told him what really happened. So Nelson reneged on our agreement, failed to interview too well, and used my father's footage anyway. And then later, as a final thank you from PBS on their official website, there's discussion questions and a study guide for school children designed to indoctrinate them into what, believe, what to believe about what they need, and a rather lengthy bibliography of source documents and suggested reading material used in the film. Can you guess which book they left off the list? So now we have PBS, with the help of, of Stanley Nelson, erase any trace of the wounded knee victims and the wounded knee murders. Well, eventually, they added our book to the list after our lawyer contacted their lawyer. But then one of our therapy experts, Professor Russell Edmonds, University of Texas, said of our complaint about the dishonest premise of the film, I believe that Trimbach's protest reflects the perspective of a very small group of people with a particular agenda and will be generally ignored by almost everyone else. He hopes so, Professor Evans. PBS executive Mark Samuels wrote, Our producers took great pains to be even-handed in the portrayal of a seizure movie need. Really, this film shows none of the village damage, none of the village destruction, none of it. Here's one of the eight criminals Professor Evans helps elevate the hero status in the film, Carter Camp. Camp has been repeatedly caught in a lie about knowing Ray Robinson, although he was allegedly present when Robinson was shot. If you ask him today, Camp will say he never heard of that. You know what's interesting is he has never interviewed Adrian Pritz, who, unlike Professor Evans, actually lived in Wounded Knee, who watched her village being systematically destroyed, and who was pressed by the TV news people about the questions she would be asked and the answer she was to give in front of the cameras. So I asked you, who is the real expert on the Adrian Fritz, whose family is just as native as Russell Lee's clan, or Professor Evans, the paid expert who dismisses our research and who now fights for murderers? I'll make you another promise, ladies and gentlemen. You read American Indian Mafia, and Adrian's book, Quest for the Fight for the Sioux, you'll know more about Moody D73 than most professors of Indian studies, and certainly more than Professor Evans.
Adrian, by the way, is right here. And she can dispel many of the wounded bee myths. The media and academia have been telling for the last 39 years. I'm afraid the people behind the PBS film and others like it really exhibit the same interest in the truth about wounded bee as most other historians and self-described experts. The question is, why do they further the lies? Well, one reason is they probably think it is somehow beneficial to Native Americans, which of course it isn't. What they don't understand is that when you promote liars, thieves, and killers as worthy role models and heroes of Indian country, you do a huge disservice to Native Americans everywhere. You know that sounds pretty basic, but these people, these very opinionated academics and their friends in the media, they just don't get it. And so our book is ridiculed, ignored, or simply disposed of, like this guy, Jim Page, who claims to be open-minded and tolerant, but who told us with pride that our book disappeared from the Seattle Public Library. What they especially don't like is that American Indian Mafia dispels conspiracy theories and myths about the movie and related events. Dozens of them. Here are just a few of all that have been exposed that pertain to just the FBI. The myth that the FBI backed Roaming Dental Clause on the reservation, used a go and tell pro against him, had a contract out on Dennis Banks, tried to assassinate Leonard Peltier, failed to investigate murders on the Pine Ridge Reservation, was guilty of misconduct in the Wounded Heat Trial, trained Leonard Peltier for the murder of Agents Colbert Williams, and was behind Reign of Terror on the reservation. Also, behind the murder of NMA and the ensuing cover-up. You want to know who was really behind the murder of NMA? It wasn't just Arnold and John, but why both of them convicted. How about the AIM leadership? How about a named lawyer, Bruce Ellison? A named co-conspirator who allegedly interrogated NMA as she sat tied up in his office. Ellison once testified before a UN Human Rights Committee about the horrible things the FBI did to NMA. And for the last 37 years, Ellison, who has repeatedly taken the fifth before a grand jury, has conspired with this guy, former AIM spokesman John Trudell, in spreading the story that the FBI was behind the murder and they themselves were involved in covering up. I believe Trudell could have put a stop to it, but couldn't stand up to Dennis Banks. And Arlo says this guy, fairly average, the son of Senator James Avers was at Bill Meade's house the night they brought him in there before the others took her out and shot her in the head. And this guy, named lawyer Ken Tilson, has trouble explaining how he ended up owning an enemy built. Tilson won a lifetime achievement award from the ACLU, which is ironic given a lifetime taken from NMA. Interesting that Tilson's legal records from the period of NMA's disappearance have also disappeared. Today, Tilson presides over the extensive wounded bee collection of the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, a propagandized assortment of sanitized material made for by the taxpayers. But it's possible they missed something. At a smaller collection at the University of South Dakota, my father and I found this document, which indicates that federal judge Miles Lord was in conjunction with his fellow judges to prevent other wounded bee cases from coming to trial. So you never know what you're calling. The American Indian Mafia also makes the case that the corruption of today's media had its roots in wounded knee. The first large-scale historical event where the media aided and abetted the criminals. And the cover-up continues. We asked the director of the National Museum of the American Indian, Kevin Dover, if he would allow our book to be sold in the museum bookstore as a counterbalance to the main propaganda that he now sells. Dover won't even return our phone calls or answer our letters. And I hear that ABC Disney has bought up all the old wounded bee footage and won't allow some people to view it. So you have to wonder, what are they afraid of? I'm up against the clock, so here quickly are some of the newspapers that declined to review the American Indian Mafia, even after receiving a copy from our publisher. Well, my favorite is the Rapid City Journal. This paper has had numerous opportunities to interview Joe Trimbach, not interested, and has been known to give libelous headlines to people involved in these murders. Perhaps it's because we destroy either in whole or in part the credibility of several established and sanctified accounts of wounded knees, such as these. University 
in Nebraska, perhaps the greatest academic falsifier in history, because he recycles the same old lines over and over, most of which were hatched by the perpetrator in the spirit of crazy ones. This book, built around the rehabilitation of the convicted killer Larry Peltier, is considered the undisputed Bible of the aim legacy among most academics. I took the liberty of highlighting Matheson's tribute to enemies killers. Blue indicates political views.
Ojibwe Warrior, this is Dennis Banks' autobiography. Banks has knocked out his new film, A Good Day to Die. I call it A Good Day to Lie because it's never been a finer propaganda film made and designed to cover up one's role in several murders. Banks recently inaugurated a walk across America on behalf of another murderer, Leonard Peltier. So I have to ask the question, is this the best we can do for any of role models and heroes? This is how we think about it. I recently received an email from Agnes Gildersleeve's daughter, Joanne. Agnes and her husband, Clyde, lived in Wounded Knee Village and ran the training post. Agnes is often described as a white woman by the so-called historians. What they don't tell you is that she was a Chippewa Indian enrolled in the same tribe as her oppressor, Dennis Banks. Joanne's email mentioned her mother's wedding rings, stolen by Banks when he moved into their home in Wounded Knee and where he proceeded to steal their cash, their personal belongings, their family heirlooms, their car keys, and pretty much anything a petty thief could get away with stealing. Message to Dennis from Joanne. You can keep everything you stole from my parents, but I want the wedding rings back. According to Leonard Peltier's cousin, Bob Rodu, and other people familiar with the facts, <coughs> Banks was undoubtedly involved in the murder of Anna May, which explains why he knew she was dead a week before the FBI identified her remains. I believe Banks was also behind the murders of Ray Robinson and any other victims that were unique, including the murder of Buddy Lamont. Made to look like he was hit by a government bullet, Lamont was shot in the chest during one of the fiercest gun battles of the King. Banks claims Lamont was shot in the back. Soon after Lamont was hit, the record shows that the government called for a ceasefire. Banks refused. He let Lamont lay out there for two hours before agreeing to a ceasefire. That's not going to work either. <laughs> okay, go to the next one. I have some video clips for you, but it's not going to happen. I recently heard from another woman who tells me Banks threatened her if she did not turn over control of the fund she had set up to help the impoverished Indians after which she raided the fund. I've also been told that banks used to police rich old widows for income. This is the hero often praised and promoted by Native News Network. I understand you will have a chance to view his over the top film. I guess it really is a good day to lie. I'm on that One of Dennis's buddies is George Russell Means. In his book, Means talks about wanting to murder many people, and he's not joking. Although most of his book is a bunch of hot air, I believe Russell when he says he and Dennis could make people disappear. If you look at the FBI Women Reports in March 1973, you'll see where Means and Banks were seen as leaving the village. Leo Wilcox, a fellow council member, and an outspoken critic of Bain, just found dead, burned alive in his car just outside the village, immediately after which the report says Means and Banks slipped back into the village. Well, figure. Means claims to be a big supporter of women, but during the wounded knee occupation, one of his goons sexually assaulted 12 year old Adrian Prince. And this woman, Susanna Craig, aka Looking That Woman, ceremonial steward for the Canunca Walker, says Russell Means raped her when she was 17 at a Catholic girls' high school in Spokane, Washington. In his book, Means and Vince, he was ready to murder the female juror foreman in the Martin Monson murder trial after which he wrote about this plan, and the jury come back with a wrong verdict. And then there's Means' involvement in the murder of Anna May. Which again, we won't have a video of him saying this, but this is what he said. He says he had no part in the murder, although he threw his brother Bill and Clyde Delacourt under the bus in 1999 with these comments. So how is it that every, just about every member of the Means clan, Bill, Buddy, Ted, Laura, like Madonna, Aunt Theta, Troy Lynn, along with Clyde, were all involved, but not their leader? If Russell was not a part of it, why is he so chummy with Dennis, who many believe was? And isn't it interesting that in Russell's huge autobiography, there's not a single mention of the woman whose funeral he boycotted? You see, at the time, he still believed Anime was a traitor to the cause. But who is the real traitor? After reading our book, you'll wonder why a couple of retired killers are honored not the vile at the historical conference. Next, you're going to hear from Paul DeMay and Denise Maloney. I want you to know that I consider Paul my brother and Denise my sister. 
Father, we don't agree on all issues, but we are united in bringing the truth to light. When I wrote a prayer of Mafia in the spring place of Waukee, I felt we had anime's blessing. I felt your presence. If you were in the courtroom of the John Henry trial, you know what I'm talking about. Waukee is based on a true story, which means some people won't like it, but if you want to read it, I think you'll find it very interesting. There's a lot more I'd like to tell you, but we're out of time. But you can find it in this book. Perhaps now you understand how we call American Indian Mafia the history book. They really don't want you to read. And that is because it tells the truth about what happened at New Year's Eve. And along with Quest for the Pike, it is the only book that tells the, the truth about what happened at New Year's which is why the academics and the so-called experts hate it. So they ignore it, disparage our conclusions, or question our motives. But the one thing they cannot do and have not done is refute our research. Why do they persist in defending the falsified history of the Perhaps they do not want you to know the truth in order to protect their precious reputations, their petty insecurities, and their invested in wholesale academic fraud. And they believe they can get away with it. Prove them wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Help us expose the hypocrisy. And above all, respect the truth. One other thing, this is very important. There's little doubt that aimed for a wide path of destruction that left the primary preservation in historical shambles, the effects of which are still felt today. According to native publisher Tim Gallego, over the last five years, Pine Ridge has received $1 billion in government aid. One billion, and yet Pine Ridge still has unemployment over 80%, and alcoholism rate close to 90%. And we estimate that half the children are sexually abused by the alcoholic adults. And every year, there's a celebration of the destruction of Moody Village. They call it the liberation of Moody Me. <clears throat> there was nothing left to liberate. Until the real legacy of Moody and the American Indian movement and the truth is acknowledged, there's little chance for a much needed spiritual revival on the reservation. The children of Pine Ridge certainly deserve better than what we've given them. I encourage you to read the epilogue in American Indian Mafia to find out what you can do to help. Thank you.
that that deal fell apart because they were ready to give it up? Well, uh, they continued to fire at my agents and the marshals. The agents merely defended themselves. They uh, entered into several ceasefires and then both the ceasefire. My agents didn't want to be there. They had no reason to want to prolong it. They didn't want to go back home. They would quit the train with that kind of good uh, They didn't prolong it. Somebody go along with this. They were ready to give it up that night. It's all in our books, Senator. Please read our books. I would have spent a nickel on your books. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 